Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. This is part four of the episode with Patrick Manifold that started just the other day. If you missed anything, please, please go back. But Patrick, before we do get into part four, is the author of this book, New Year, Better You. It's a fantastic read. He talks about many, many personal development strategies and goes deep into goal setting and the art of that. Um, but he's got many, many other books as well that we do discuss uh, briefly in the episode. Please go to the show notes and click on that if you missed it. Uh, but yesterday in part three, Patrick Manifold uh, shares his deeply personal story about struggling with self-esteem and how he used goal setting to tr transform his life. If you haven't listened to that yet, I highly recommend it for sure. Uh, but today in part four, Patrick and I dive into the topic of confidence. Patrick talks about the perception others have of him. You know, he's a big guy, he's at six foot seven, and he, he, he it's important that he, he knows, he recognizes people are not gonna grab, go up to him and grab him to shake him into, into, in, into shape. He has to do it for himself. Uh, and he's trying to get that message out to everybody else as well. Um, but you know, there's a deeper, more poignant side to his story. Patrick opens up about moments of despair, times when he questioned his own worth and existence. Really, really sad. You know, he, he asks a, a powerful question um, because it's an experience based on his own. You know, have you ever been told you won't amount up to anything? You know, whether it's from a teacher, a family member or a friend, many of us have felt the sting of those words. So Patrick reflects on the impact these negative comments had on him and how certain people in his life influenced journey, uh, his journey with their words. Uh, so tune in as we explore his, these heartfelt uh, and motivating insights from the good old man, Patrick Manifold. Um, and uh, please come back for part five tomorrow. If you've missed any of the previous episodes, please go back to part one, two, and three, and uh, please press subscribe. We'll be right back with Patrick. Enjoy of being negative to going, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to, I'm going to achieve my dreams. I'm going to achieve my goals. What was it that ignited that change? I, I, if I'm correctly from what you said, it wasn't the Tony Robbins thing that accelerated it, but it wasn't the yeah. Tony Robbins thing. No, it was the experience with basketball. Actually, like okay. the longer version of that story is the fact that my family came to see me. And that was at a time where the team I was playing for in Kings Lynn at the time, we just got some new professionals that came over from America um, and they were like having to, like one of them had to play my position. So I didn't, wasn't getting as many, as many minutes as I used to. And they actually surprised me and came up to watch me play. And we went out to Pizza Hut afterwards, which is where my girlfriend was working. And I couldn't even look any of them in the eye. I was just so ashamed and disappointed of myself because I believed I was better than that. And they got like, I was playing in all these other games and they just got this fun snippet. Like we said earlier, like they never come and see my games. They surprised me. And then it just happened to be a game that I didn't play very much for whatever reason, matchup, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that was just like, that's how they're going to remember me. Like, and I was just so angry and frustrated and sad and like angry at myself. And that, that was literally the moment. Like that was like, when I was looking in the mirror, I was shouting at myself. I was, I, I remember walking in that door and my family don't even know this. But I remember walking in that door and we had like a hallway, that, like the bathroom here and then the hallway that went into like the rest of all the rooms. I say all the rooms. It was one room <laughs> divided up into a bed and a kitchen and a, a couch. Oh, wow. But I didn't even make it halfway down that hallway and I put my back against the wall and I sunk down and I cried like a baby for like 20 minutes. And then after that is when I got angry and started shouting at myself. But I'm okay with that. Still to this day, I still have uh, situations like that where – I will, I will shout myself. If I was in my pub, I've got a British pub in my back garden where I smoke cigars and I think and stuff like that. And it wasn't that long ago that I, was, I had a couple of drinks on a Saturday night, which I typically tend to do just for fun. And I was thinking about some goals that I had and I, I yelled at myself because I, I believe that like we, we can't be like super soft with ourselves. Like no one else is going to tell me what to do. I'm six foot seven. I'm 225 pounds. I am as confident as a man can possibly be. It's very unlikely that anyone is going to come and grab me around the, you know, the collar and say, Hey, come on, you need to do better. It's not mm -hmm. going to happen. So that version of me that is capable of more, sometimes he, he gets mad and he says, Hey, you're a little too comfortable, buddy. Let's go ahead and uh, take a step up to the next level. And I'm okay with it. It, it, it. That changed my life, that experience. And I'm grateful it happened. Everything, everything bad. When I look back on my life, all the things like I was just being redirected into something else. It's like, it was it was all blessings, and I'm I'm grateful for all of them. That was your Michael Jordan being dropped from the varsity high school team. Exactly. Scenario. Exactly. Yeah. And I think everyone has that. And and it's who are you in that moment? 
are you the one that goes back and cries like a baby, shouts at yourself, buys a book and changes your life? Or are you goes back, disappoints in yourself, start eating more, start drinking more, start caring a little bit less, do more things that kind of wreck your life. And then you go on even a worse decline. Like those two people, like I could have made a different decision that day. And if I had, maybe hopefully I would have, you know, got to it eventually, but who knows? I was in a pretty dark place doing pretty stupid stuff. And like who I am now is someone that I'm, I'm proud of myself. And it took a long, took a long time for me to say that even after even some of my biggest achievements like I, I had the first time I felt proud of myself in my life was when I went to America and the second time was when I turned professional yeah. or the second time was when I graduated and the third time was when I turned professional and like that was the first the first three times in my entire life that I felt proud of myself and that sounds sad like saying that out loud but it's, no. it's the truth it's honest it. and it's vulnerable yeah how you don't obviously need to go into the scenarios but um, I want everyone to see because every, everyone can see the color in you, your personality, what you're doing right now. Everyone can, I can see the color, and I'm sure everyone else can who's watching. Paint a picture briefly. Um, how dark? How dark did it get for you? I I don't want to use the word depression because that wasn't a word that I used back then, mm -hmm. and I don't want to. I know there's people that really go through that and have that word as like a big part of their life, so I don't want to say it was that but I'm pretty sure it was the same kind of feeling like this being lost, being feeling worthless. Um, yeah, there's, I haven't thought about that in a long time. That's what I'm here for. But yeah, like it was, uh, it was dark. It was, uh, a, it's scary to think back that I was even contemplating some of those things and thinking about some of those things. And, basically second guessing if I even needed to be there. Like if I, I'm just a waste of space and everyone was right about me. And that, did you contemplate that? I'm not going to say I didn't contemplate it. I, I don't think I ever actually had any intentions of doing anything about it, mm -hmm. but definitely those conversations in my mind were happening. Like what's the point? Mm -hmm. And the sh like the deep shame like and disappointment in myself and feeling like I was letting everybody down and like proving everybody right about me. Like my, like my English teacher in high school, and I've told this story a bunch of times, but my English teacher in high school one day, she it was like a, a lesson in class where she said, what do you want? What does everyone want to be when you get older? Like write it down and then we're going to go around the, the class and do it. And obviously I said, I want to be a professional basketball player. And <laughs> everyone laughed, hmm, yeah. you know, never going to happen. And then she said, anything else? Is that, all, is that your only plan for life? I was like, well, one day I actually wouldn't mind writing a book. Like, I think that would be a, a cool thing. I think that would be something that would last longer than me. I thought that would be cool. And my teacher, I think her name was Mrs. Wright. She just started laughing. And then that made the rest of the kids in the class laugh. Mm. And when she eventually stopped laughing and I felt like that big, she mm. said, Patrick, you can barely read a book. What makes you think that you're ever going to be able to write one? And if you do, why would anyone want to hear from you? Jeez. I remember that like it was yesterday. It's like kind of seared into my mind. So when I talk about like coming from a place where there was no expectations, there were expectations of me. There were big expectations of me to fail yeah. and be just go to prison, die, whatever. Like that was the expectation of me back then. So yeah, like it comes from a pretty, pretty dark place. Mm. But, and I just, I, I'm not trying to shame anybody that has things, but if you let all the things that happen, negative things that happen to you define who you are, like I meet people sometimes and they, the first thing out of their mouth is something like a bad thing that happened to them, sometimes really bad, but it's a bad thing that happened to them like five, 10, 15, 25 years ago. And my belief is that you are not defined by how other people treat you. You are defined by what you choose to do with your life. Mm. There are going to be obstacles. There are going to be times that life is going to metaphorically punch you in the face, right? And it's going to tear you down and try and break you. But it, who are you after that? Are you someone that becomes, allows that misery to engulf you so it becomes your identity? 
okay? And then you be, just become a victim. And now you're just, all you talk about is this bad thing happened to me. Okay, bad things happen to a lot of people. Normally a lot worse things have happened to other people than have happened to you, like pretty much across the board. So no matter how bad that thing was, it was meant to be a lesson, not a life sentence, right? Like you can, you, and sometimes it's not even a lesson. Sometimes it's just someone really bad did something really bad to you. You didn't deserve it. There was no other motive for it. Like it was just a, a shitty thing that happened. And you have to be able to get past that. Because if you don't, that person, that thing, that scenario, that situation, they win. You allow them to win. Every time you talk about it, you allow them to win. You allow them to have a negative impact on your life. And my belief is that you got to come to a point where you're just like, you know what? Line in the sand here. That was maybe who I used to be. From now on, I'm going to focus on only the things that I can control. I can't go back there and change it. No matter how much I want to, I can't go back and change it. So I have to accept it. I have to accept it. And then I have this thing in my mind where some of the bad things that happened to me when I was younger or bad experiences I went through or, or sometimes not even things I went through, but like I have this like monkey mind that tries to make up these really bad scenarios of how things might go, right? And I don't know, I didn't know how to control that in the past. I have these like mental exercises and there's this thing called neuro-linguistic program, which I got into like 10 years ago. Oh. And I will take like this idea and I'll see it in my mind, this kind of horrible scenario or something that happened to me, whatever. And I'll see it as like a, you know, like a 4K movie on my 65 inch TV. That's how I see it in my mind. And I'll take it, and I'll turn it into a piece of paper. I'll make it black and white. I'll scrabble it into a, a, like a, basically a, like a ball of paper and I'll throw it up and I'll hit it with a baseball bat. And in my mind, it goes so far, like beyond the stratosphere, like so far, that I can't even see it. And I say, as it's going, I say, I never want to see you again. And like that, like that was a, a technique that I would use to stop myself from thinking about those things and whatever. Like there's a, that was a way for me to get rid of some of that negativity and some mm. of those bad things that happened. And now I don't really think about that stuff anymore. And I try to focus on, I tr always try to focus on things I have control over. I'm a bit mm -hmm. of a, my wife will tell you, I'm a little bit of a control freak. I like to, things to be how I want them to be, which is obviously why I'm an entrepreneur. And yeah. I'm not getting a job at Walmart because I just wouldn't be very good at that. Right. So yeah. you play to your strengths and yeah, it, it was dark, but now it couldn't be brighter and I couldn't yeah, be more excited yeah. about my future. Mm. Mate, I'm excited. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's inspiring. I think a lot of people will get a lot from it, but those scenarios that you mentioned and you painted for us, <clears throat> do you think all of this, the basketball career, you know, what you're doing now, do you think any, all of this would have happened in the same way if those didn't happen probably not like we're not some things that, that happened to you are bad like the, when i think about my dad when i was younger all i wanted was my dad to be proud of me like that was all i wanted right mm -hmm. and he for whatever reason wasn't very good at that like he wasn't very like emotional when it cut like be saying he loved me and hugging me and kissing me and all those things that just wasn't in his nature mm -hmm. uh, and back then i was upset about it back then like it took me getting trials to, you know, be great at basketball, like for everyone else to see before he could say that he was proud of me. And back then I didn't understand it and it upset me. And now I just have total empathy for just, he was just a, an older, from a different generation. Like it wasn't that he didn't love me. He just didn't, it wasn't a dumb thing to tell people that. It was like, oh, they know about it. You know, you know tough. Everyone's dad of, of that age, right? So that me, I'm just a sensitive, I'm a, I'm a weird, I'm like this massive guy and I'm basically a woman. Like I was brought up by women. I was surrounded by women. I know every like word to friends and pretty women and all these, like I'm basically a woman in this big man's like alpha body. Um, but I am sensitive and some things that like maybe wouldn't affect everybody that much. Those things really affected me when I was growing up. Yeah. But me trying to work to get my dad's approval and even through all through college, and trying to like call him and tell him that, you know, I've, I've done something great that he could finally be proud of me. Mm. Maybe that was a great driver. And maybe I would have never tried to achieve that much if I wasn't, didn't have something that meant so much to me, which was his love or my mum's love or whatever the case may be. If I didn't have those as drivers, maybe I wouldn't have done it. And now, thankfully, I've got to a level in my life where number one, I do believe they are proud of me because they tell me that. But more importantly, that now I don't need it anymore. Mm. right like I, I yes i want it because i'm a human and i have feelings 
but now I am empathetic to why they are the way they are or the why they were, the, why they were the way they were. Mm. I'm just empathetic to that as a, like, cause I'm now like a, I study human psychology. I study that. I, I know what makes people do what they do. And I know the effects of like, I got out of my hometown and have now had all these wonderful experiences. All I've lived all around the world, seven countries, three continents. Like I've had a massive experience of life that most people don't have the opportunity to have. My parents have been in one or two places and stayed there their whole life. Of course, they're going to be infiltrated by that negativity and not just my, my family, but everybody around. Like I'm empathetic to that. So I'm not judgmental anymore. I'm not sad about it anymore. I just accept it for what it is. And I know that I've, what I have, I have accepted is for the long time, I thought I could change everyone. I thought I could help everyone. And now I've realized that some people just flat out don't want help and they, they're, they're, they're happy being miserable or they're happy not being ambitious or whatever the case may be. So I have to stop looking at the world through my eyes and saying, why aren't you more ambitious? You're capable of so much more. Why don't you do it? And some people just, they don't, either they don't have that or they don't want that. And I, I've, I'm not going to beat down doors that, where they've you know, bolted it and they don't want me to come in. I'm here for all the people who are trying to take a, a next step in their life and become happier. Yeah. Yes. It, it, and I think that baseline of where we should feel, I feel like with everything that, again, we touched on before, the influences from, I don't know, whether it's technology and food that we've digested differently over the last hundred years since, you know, ultra processed foods have been introduced. But uh, I feel like our baseline is, is below, you know, so when people say they're amazing, maybe we, we were meant to always feel like this, but we've just right. lowered that baseline over the last X hundred years i don't know a thousand years um i don't know yeah it's just something i always think about you know um your mother you said she was a teacher what role Mm -hmm. did she play in your upbringing then she was there all the time like i was uh my mum and my dad were both teachers teachers for like 30 years Mm -hmm. and yeah they were my i would only see my dad normally on weekends and it wasn't they weren't together no, they they got divorced when I was two, I think. Oh, right. uh, so, and and that was a that was a challenging thing, like having like different stepdads and stuff throughout the course of my young life, like having male role models. That, now, one of them did care about me, and the other two, you know, maybe maybe didn't, you know. Yeah. But those are things that like challenges that people go through, and yeah. I could absolutely like if I wanted to paint the picture of all the bad shit that's happened to me in my life, like some of it really bad, some of it averagely bad i guess i could absolutely be like i could be a victim man i'd be a real good victim i'd have enough stories like hey i got plenty for you like i got plenty of reasons why i suck and why why i couldn't possibly be successful or be happy because look at all this stuff happened to me you know i never had a chance bullshit absolute bollocks right those things happen and i have now made a different decision about who i'm going to be as a man and as a father and as an uh, an inspiration to hopefully people not again not that i am great in in, in any way and anyone should like kind of look up to me other than i m- was miserable and hated my life and now i'm deliriously happy and love my life and i figured out a way for to get from here to here and that's all like i don't teach people how to forex trade i don't teach people how to you know do stuff that i don't know how to do i only teach people to do what i did which is get from misery to happiness yeah. Right, and I'm just trying to. Hey, here's some different stepping stones you can take to get there. That's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Uh, if there's only one follower, mate, I'm definitely it. That's for sure. Well, I appreciate uh, it. My uh, number one 100%. fan. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, <laughs> you've turned a Canadian here. Don't do that. And <laughs> um, so the middle part, then. So we'll leave your your childhood. Let's talk about your basketball career. Where did you Where did you play? I mean, I know I briefly mentioned at the beginning, but it's it's your story. You paint the picture. Where did you Which Which university did you go to? Where Where When When you finished university, where did you come back to? So real quick, I went, went to school in Norwich at Notre Dame High School, mm-hmm. and there's a guy called Levi Yutku who played for, I think it was played for the Turkish national team. Very good basketball player, very good coach, kind of got me into it. And then when I left him, I went to Kings Lynn. There's a guy called James Banfield, very, very intelligent coach, really nice guy, uh, still doing great things in the basketball world. He took me under his wing, so to speak, him and Wesley Lockwood, uh, and they basically helped me to kind of cultivate some. I was in some Wesley 
and I hope he gets to watch this. I remember walking down the street one day. I was in a gang in my hometown, and we were doing things we shouldn't have been doing. And I was walking down the street, and I heard someone yell, Pat. And I turned around, and it was Wesley, or Wes, as I used to call him. Mm-hmm. And he told me, that, oh, I'm in Kings Lynn. I'm playing basketball again, like blah, blah, blah. I haven't played basketball like two years at this point. I was, like I said, smoking and doing bad shit and clubbing every night and all that kind of stuff. And he said, you should think about maybe playing again. And I went to a tryout. He, he, he actually introduced me to James Banfield. Uh, and I was absolutely, I went to a, like a tryout where they was playing somewhere in Norwich. And I, I, I couldn't feel my lungs. Like you, you try smoking 20 cigarettes a day, not doing exercise for two years and then playing basketball for an hour. Like it's, it's tough. Anyway, that's how it started. And then I was, was in Kings Lynn for like about four or five years, which is like an hour and a half away from where I lived in Great Yarmouth and played for the Kings Lynn Fury, which uh, ended up being the College West Angler Fury. And we went up to National League Division One, and at that point, I got pretty good. And then I just made a bunch of tapes, and then basically made a website and some highlight tapes, and just cold emailed a bunch of people in America, hoping to get through to someone at a school. And that was I started doing that after I read the Tony Robbins book, like three weeks after or something like that. And then basically, some people got back to me. One person really was like calling me and emailing me every day, and that was Coach Cummings, Terry Cummings, in University of Maine in Prescott. And that was where we went to university in America and went there for four years and ended up being the captain of the team for three of those four years. And like nice. I said, was national player of the year, my senior year for the NCAA Division Three Independence. So it was, it was a great time and it allowed me to be an All-American and national player of the year. It allowed me to make my dream of becoming a pro reality. And I moved, I, after I graduated, I went to play professionally in Glasgow, Scotland, Surrey, England. Uh, Melbourne, Australia, Magdeburg, Germany, and just outside of Milan, Italy, a place called Bergamo. And that was like my whole life, like was basketball. But I knew there was always going to be something after. So I knew I was always going to be a businessman. Like that was, uh, and you might actually get this reference. No one here gets it. But I used to look up to Phil Mitchell on EastEnders because he'd have a pub (laughs) and he'd have a cafe. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.